Thanks. First, I'd like to introduce Mairead Nikriath, Professor of Culture and Heritage at Heriot Watt University. Mairead will be looking at cultural diversity and human rights. To Anna Hasarm Vehensa Hermagen, Milbuichus Joanna Sangurum. I very much enjoyed this morning, and I think it has all been very positive. And for me, probably one of the most positive aspects of today is what I would call the mainstreaming of intangible cultural heritage. Uh, and by that I mean that very often when people think about intangible cultural heritage, they think about, and I use this word in inverted commas, just stories and songs. But of course they do forget that those stories and songs contain knowledge and contain traditional knowledge that has been passed down from one generation to the next. But I think we've also seen through Janet's provocation and through discussions here this morning, the expansion of the concept to include issues like sustainable development, like inclusivity, like human rights, like the environment, all of that is relevant for all of us. No one can say intangible cultural heritage isn't for them if they're a human being. However, I'm also conscious that this morning we're speaking to the converted. I bet everyone in this room is passionate about intangible cultural heritage. But there are a lot of people out there who are not. So how do we get that message across? What is the problem? So I hope I'm not going to be too negative, but I am going to highlight a few issues. And one is the English word heritage itself. And note, we nearly always talk about it in the singular. We rarely use the word heritages. Um, and that actually suits many nation states who like to think about a national heritage or a monocultural heritage or a hegemonic heritage. It suits them to think of heritage in the singular, whereas really we should be talking about the diversity of our heritages. Um, heritage also, people have talked about this morning, is becoming very broad, and that's good. But does there come a point where it gets too broad? or maybe too elastic, and where it kind of means everything and anything or nothing at all. So, as one of our speakers mentioned, where do we draw the conceptual boundaries? I think that is an issue, particularly when you're looking at human rights. And I think postmodernism has a lot to blame for, actually, because we don't seem to know what we're talking about anything anymore. Heritage, identity, community, they're all suddenly gone fluid. Everyone tells me my identity is fluid and I can dip in and out of different identities. But basically, actually, I'm the same maraid that I was when I was that height. I'm not much taller now, but anyway. Um, I don't think our identities and our heritages are as fluid as we like to think. Um, there's also the issue of community. I mean, how do you define community? And Janet, in her provocation, asked, for example, would you say people with tattoos are a community? And I thought about that, and my initial reaction was no. And then I realized, actually, the pics were regarded as a community because they had paintings on their bodies. So, another concept is migrant. I mean, who, what's a migrant anymore? Do we know? How many generations is a migrant here before they become local? Or can you ever really become local or become indigenous? And the final word I'd like to draw attention to is globalization, because we're talking about it as if it means the same thing world over. But actually, globalization is very uneven. There's uneven development all over the world, so I much prefer to think about uneven geographical progress. I think the word globalization dilutes that. So the first issue, I think, is the weakness of the concepts themselves. And the second issue is we often talk about access to heritage and intangible cultural heritage in the, con in the context of cultural rights. But actually, cultural rights are not that well developed either. I mean, a lot of people who deal in the issue of human rights are not that sure about cultural rights. Um, very often they're called the Cinderella 
of human rights. And maybe that's a good thing, actually, because thinking about that, Cinderella ends up getting the prince. So maybe if we go down that road sooner or later, we will get the prince. But it is a weakness. Um, and another weakness, I would say, is that if you look at the various conventions, you'll see that the connection between ICH and tangible cultural heritage and rights, it's implied rather than explicit. It's not, actually, I'm half blind, so I can't see the figure. <laughs> um, so, um, um, you know, it's, it's not really explicit. It's not really something. It's there, but it's not there. And I think we need to be calling for something much more explicit in the connection between intangible cultural heritage and human rights. So what are the challenges for states and why are states nervous about it? I mean, I think one of the challenges is the whole notion of collectivities or groups, which can often cause tensions if you give rights to one group. Um, living as I did in Northern Ireland for many years, um, the Protestants, and I'm using that very simplicity um, stroke British, in the annual marching season would claim their human right to march down the Queen's Highway. Um, but from the other side, this was an infringement of their cultural space. So there was two people competing, but using the language of human rights. And very often people expressing culture use the language of human rights in a way that's not necessarily appropriate. We have issues here in the UK about fox hunting in England and arranged marriages. And we all know about 50 shades of grey when it comes to sexual matters. I think we have a thousand shades of grey when we come to cultural matters. Uh, and there's also the issue that sometimes giving people access to one's intangible cultural heritage can end up being a problem for you. Um, I, one of my PhD students, she's not here in the audience just now, but she's looking at the example of women trafficking in Spain and where the mafia, who being aware of their intangible cultural heritage, use that intangible cultural heritage to make them stay in a way that people can't understand why don't they run away. Um, culture is often seen as costing money. You hear people talking about the cost of Gaelic schools or the cost of Gaelic schools. But you don't hear them talking about the cost of English schools. It's as if the mainstream stuff is free or costless and only the minority stuff costs money. And I think we need, and we are doing that already, inverting all of that um, discourse to show actually that culture generates money. Culture generates income. Um, and intangible cultural heritage, I'm glad to say, there's been a strong focus this morning on intangible cultural heritage bringing in income. Um, so we need to dispel that myth. Maybe it's because ICH is demanding a participatory approach, as it was called this morning, um, where it's redefining the role of the nation state. It's asking states to stand back a little bit. That makes them nervous because they don't know who they're standing back from. If they give control to the communities, where is that going to go? We all know the phrase, better the devil you know than the devil you don't know. Um, and the idea is, of course, that the minute you introduce change, you also introduce some anxiety. So is it this participatory approach that is frightening states? Is it that our concept of heritage is weak. We noted this morning, actually, that the intangible cultural heritage and resistance to it is often from the Anglophone world. And sometimes I'd wish they'd draw on the Gaelic world. In Irish Gaelic, we have two words for heritage. We have Eirecht, which is heritage from above, which I like to think of as tangible heritage in a way, because that's often state-sponsored. And then we have Duchus, which is here, and that's heritage from below and that's people's heritage, and that's what I like to call intangible heritage, the people's heritage. Um, it makes me very sad, actually, that Scotland doesn't sign the intangible charter for heritage, and I think given that there are so many good things going on in Scotland about intangible cultural heritage, and in many ways what's going on here is of world leadership quality, it's a shame that I think we're not even getting more recognition for that. Um, 
I think it's not just about looking after our own intangible heritage. Signing the Charter or ratifying the Charter is not just about looking after your own. It's a moral imperative. It's a moral imperative where you're giving recognition to the whole concept of intangible cultural heritage, which is a worldwide concept. It's a concept of people. It's a concept of human beings. So it's not just for protecting ourselves or being involved in the debate. There's a whole moral reason why I think the UK should sign the Charter for Intangible Heritage. Gerv Magriff. That was brilliant. Thank you, Mairead. Next on is Tam McGarvey, an artist and musician and works with Gal Gale, the Trust, and he has worked to set up opportunities for long-term unemployed people to engage with the culture and natural heritage around Glasgow, and he's going to tell us about the impact of his work. Good afternoon, Feskarma. How's it going? Uh, yeah, um, to tell the truth, uh, it's great to sit here and share a platform with these great uh, experts and speakers here because I didn't know what ICH was until two weeks ago. <laughs> uh, I, I looked it up in the, the, the internet and um, I thought, oh, it's identity and it's um, culture and it's storytelling and it's music. And I, so that's, that's just the crack. I just thought that was the crack. And if you look up the word crack, if you don't know it, it's a, I think it's an Irish word, isn't it? <laughs> it means it's C-R-A-I-C and it means pretty much that. Now, it doesn't have anything to do with drugs at all, usually. But um, for me, uh, if you want to speak about drugs, or well, sometimes we, we work in Govan, there's quite a lot of drugs and drink in Govan. And a lot, I think a lot of these people, and as you mentioned yourself, um, the, dr the drinking, the drunkard town, um, Govan has that reputation a bit. And I think a lot of that is sometimes due to people not having connections with their heritage, whether tangible and intangible. We've got lots of great museums in Glasgow. People don't tend to engage with them if they're poorer backgrounds for some reason. Gal Gale will try to rectify that and get them back into it. And it informs a lot of the work we do. Uh, but I'll talk a wee bit about what we do in Gal Gale. Uh, it's, it's, uh, if you know about Govan, it's uh, got a lot of really bad statistics as opposed to uh, with um, addiction, crime. Is that my beard that's rubbing that microphone? Uh, it's got a lot of bad statistics. Uh, there's uh, substance abuse and things like that. Now our project uh, takes in adults who are long-term unemployed. Some of them have these issues. Uh, some of them have one or two or all of those issues. Other people uh, don't have any of those issues, just unemployed, skillful people who want to come in and spend a bit of time. Um, we do have things like uh, woodwork and uh, people chainsaws. Uh, <laughs> Um, we'd, uh, we'd, uh, we'd think we were building boats, and I could actually steal a bunch of uh, Simon slides at this point here, because uh, we've worked with the, the guys up there as well, and you've seen us on the picture earlier on. But um, my hair and my neck was really standing up when you were speaking, Ananya, because I recognise so much of that, how, you're how you've tackled it. Uh, the fact, as I say, that um, the doctor's got less work to do, the policeman's got less work to do, because people are engaging with their heads and their... Um, uh, entire cultural heritage as well. Uh, and, um, I really connect with that, and you could have put kilts on the eh, people in overalls and they would have looked like a Gal Gil Trust. Um, uh, we, we've got a, at the moment, we've got various things going on, though. We've got a, a, a wood process and the social business. We make small products. We get other people come into our project to, to do a lot of hands on stuff. Um, I don't know, I forgot to use my notes, didn't I? Uh, and you see the, see the people here, um, a, lot, a lot of them feel uh, they're despondent, they're, a lot of people are isolated, they feel uh, they've not got a stake in society, they don't have a, a anything to do with the, the world outside. Their world is often um, uh, contained within a couple of really hard-going streets of nonsense and crime and things like that. So Gal Gay, one of the things we do is um, to get them out of that, what, we, we try and uh, get them back into reclaiming the work ethic. Okay, reclaiming their work ethic. That, um, because Gal Gale, uh, Govan used to be the biggest shipbuilding centre in the world. It used to be the capital of the kingdom of Strathclyde. Um, people, a lot of people in Govan don't know or care about that. Uh, they're, they're fed up hearing about it. Uh, so we, we try and 
getting back into work. Not only that, it's kind of respectful work. If we use trees, we like them to know the provenance of the trees, the stories of the trees, why they are different, the lower of the trees. Uh, and hopefully the uh, people who have been out of work for maybe three generations um, start to reclaim that work ethic very quickly. Uh, yeah, we also like to... People uh, who are in limited incomes don't often prioritise their, their cultural heritage. Uh, but uh, for us, we, we like to celebrate the Burns Nights. We like to have garlic in the place. We always like to have a piper at celebrations. We like to wear tartan. But we also like to welcome people in from other cultures as well. Because we usually find we've got more in common than we have differences. Uh, and we usually sh like to share our food and learn, learn about their food. Because eh? it's, uh, it's like a microcosm of the world in Galgale sometimes. We've had Red Indians in and... Eskimos and Laplanders and people from all over the world. Uh, but Govan itself is uh, a place where um, it's an ancient place. It's been continually inhabited for over 2,000 years. We've had the Romans, we've had the, the Saxons, the Vikings, Picts, the Scots, and uh, pretty, uh, then we had the Irish and the, the, the Islanders and Highlanders. Now we've got people coming in from all over the world who bring their heritage with them as well. I think it enriches what we do. And it uh, also kind of parallels a lot of the stuff we do as well. Uh, what was yeah, but, uh, yeah, identity is a big one for our guys, though. They feel like that their identity is bound up in um, designer brands and things like that. The things their peers uh, uh, sort of kind of expect of them. We, we've recognised something for a while in Galgill that um, in all cultures there are... Um, Rites of passage, you, you might say, where people move on in life. It might be uh, getting your first job or getting your first car or move, going to university. If it's, the rites of passage are negative. Like um, in some, some communities, it's getting your first jail sentence, stealing your first car, blah, blah, getting stabbed, stabbing somebody, I don't know. We, we have to kind of change those, that value system. The best way we find of doing it is uh, getting people to re-embrace work, see work as a positive thing, uh, reconnect with your, the, the heritage around you and go and visit it and take your kids. Because if you imagine, say, we've had guys in our project before who have been really immersed in that world of crime and things like that. Uh, and we've taken them and sail, we've rowed them to Ireland and ancient galleys and we've taken them up the west coast and boats have built themselves. And they're going back to their kids at the end of the night and going, I wasn't in the bookies today, I didn't score a bit of hash. I, I, sorry, sorry about my... I didn't buy some drugs. <laughs> uh, and uh, they're going back and saying, I, I built a boat today, I, I, I helped to build a boat today. I rode up the Clyde, I, I was in the Isle of Egg, you know, things like that. I think um, when we start to... It's, it's, and the, the thing is, the people who come in instinctively engage with it, they don't have to go through a lot of learning and reading and things, they just feel it because it's genetic almost, you know. Um, aye. So um, we, we, we work together, we share food together, we make music on Thursday evenings, the project's open for people to come in. Uh, as I say, we're making pro produce, we're selling it, uh, so people are contributing to the project as well. We're giving them back a sense of responsibility that wasn't there before, and that they um, jump at the chance to prove themselves and pay back into the project. Um, somebody says that earlier on it's maybe some kind of postmodern thing. I would agree with the way our culture's been deconstructed, sometimes sold back to us. And Govan, for instance, was uh, the capital of the ancient Britons. Now that gets sold back to us as the whole King Arthur stuff and all that. It probably happened to Govan, you know. <laughs> but, uh, and there's lots of, lots of elements of Scottish culture, because it's so rich and great imagery and great landscape, the people I work with don't get to enjoy it or share it or engage with it too much, but they, they watch it on television and with videos and things like that. So, uh, let's see, how long have we got left? A minute? Is that, I've, I've done a minute or I've got a minute left? <laughs> right. um, so, it's a simple, I, 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 I totally see a parallel and that's interesting because your, your approach is similar to what we're doing, Govan, so that, that makes a pattern. There's something happening in another part of the world, miles away, 
that they're using. So maybe we've got something that we could start looking at, because if the same thing's happening in Govan, it's happening where, where Ananya showed there. That, uh, but we pretty much just have three things we like to provide. A venue, just uh, a safe haven for people to come to where they'll feel safe. We give them some tools that could be uh, hand-on tools or personal tools, and a bit of respect and trust. And they kind of do quite a lot of it, the rest of it myself, we, we input. And quite often, um, they turn out to be more, uh, end up teaching me, you know. They're more talented, they're be better than me. So um, it's bringing out that, um, I hate using this phrase, but uh, discovering the Pavarotti's within the poverty sometimes. <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> but uh, lastly, um, I would say, there's economic benefits in this. If you're keeping doctors out the way, you're keeping the police out of the way, you're keeping people off drugs, you're, you're doing all these things, you're improving people's mental health, you're making the communities more viable and working better. There's a massive economic saving in there, but it also, also makes people's lives better as well. I don't know why um, governments don't look at this kind of work more. Sometimes I think it's an ideological thing. I don't know. But um, I would just like to finish off by saying, um, come down and visit my project any time you like and come and see it for yourself. Okay, thank you. Bye. Thank you for that. Um, I'm sure there'll be a few questions afterwards. So finally, we are going to hear from Yurin Neiring, who's the Comparative Anthropologist and Director of NGO Tapis Plan, um, which is the Centre of Expertise for ICH and Participation. And we're going to hear about the wider cultural work of Tapis Plan. I was reflecting what to tell today, and um, I prepared a presentation, but I wanted to adapt it, uh, considering the presentations we would hear before, so I will improvise a bit, but during all the stories we have heard, I thought maybe I should express that actually the convention is like an opportunity, and it's about choosing which role we all want to play within that framework. And um, as Janet Blake also uh, has told us, um, it is, you, you all, always have the perspective of those layers. You have those plural identities. And I think many of us here as museums, NGOs, uh, the story I will tell is one of an NGO, um, is a question of choice. Which role will we play in that? And we are playing in a very international networked uh, context. Uh, I think what Museums and Galleries Scotland is doing is also giving this chance to network and to learn from each other. Uh, and from that point on, we can all choose which role we play individually in our local communities, uh, maybe nationally and even internationally. The story I want to tell you is one of these very interconnected stories, and it has many layers. Um, we, I myself, I, I was born in Bruges. Um, let's just start with that. Um, I was born in Bruges, and it's a World Heritage, UNESCO World Heritage City, and I think being young in Bruges has had a very large effect on me. Uh, I never wanted to do having anything to do with the monumental side of heritage, so I choose the, uh, the, the side of the, the living heritage, because living in Bruges has had a very strong impact of this World Heritage Convention, and uh, people living in Bruges often feel denied, not having the space they, they deserve, having their own little stories and so on. So this has driven um, me and my friends uh, from when we were teenagers to work on heritage, but in another way. Uh, and this um, was the same period that internationally, actually, a lot started to uh, evolve around the, the Convention for Intangible Heritage. So when I was 18 years, this all came together, and it's part of uh, the story and which roles we play. But starting with Bruges, so you have this, this question of uh, what is intangible heritage in a, a, an urban context. Um, I'm very conscious that this is a, a luxury question in a, in a Western European uh, tourist city where heritage is really like an economical resource, uh, resource and so on. But it has its own problems, uh, and people also are engaging with it. So there is this luxury problem of, of a, a city that is too touristic, 
that is too nice, that uh, has too much heritage to live in, and so on. Um, and it has also its counter sites. Um, there was one in 2008, uh, when this story starts. There was a street that was just next to the city center and where uh, local people were fleeing because it's, uh, on the one side, too busy in Bruges with tourists, but on the other side you have those parts in the town where you have like emptying um, uh, neighborhoods and, and emptying um, local shops and so on. So a question of, of urban development actually. Um, on that moment there was a lot of crises or challenges or you can name it as you wish uh, happening in the international sphere. We saw the ecological crisis, uh, there was a fin financial crisis in 2008 uh, there was the starting, uh, but it, I will come to that later, of the, the uh, of course, the heritage um, operational directives of uh, the 2003 convention. So uh, a lot of coinciding things. And um, in the heritage side, we saw that there was the shift from the more um, the tangible to the intangible uh, side, the idea of protection going to safeguarding from past to future oriented. Um, uh, maybe also uh, thinking of not only sustainable development or sustainability, but also the way of making communities re uh, having resilience. Um, and of course, a participatory turn that was getting all over. At the same time, we are not only living in Bruges, of course, we are also living in Flanders and Belgium. Uh, it is a federal state, the Flemish community has its own um, cultural policy, and from the beginning on, uh, just like Janet Blake, there were some people from Flanders uh, that were very active in, in the reflections on, on the, uh, this convention of 2003. Uh, and as soon as the operational directives were finished, uh, they were starting uh, to make their own policy. Our NGO was on that moment getting professional. We were very young, very driven uh, by the participatory approach. Um, we had this experience of Bruges, so we just jumped into that and we got the opportunity actually uh, of the Flemish government to, to take a leading role um, as an NGO in the network uh, of, of actors that are busy uh, with intangible heritage. But also in Bruges, there was in that moment um, a call for urban development projects. And we thought, okay, this is our, our chance, let's throw it all together and interconnect what we see happening on the international scale with the uh, uh, national scale and with the local scale uh, and try to make um, a labo, uh, you call it like that, a labo, uh, a kind of experiment, how the local policy making could be uh, interacting with all those ideas that are happening internationally, but that maybe are not yet um, in, the, in the minds of policymakers locally. So I will just run very quick through my story on Handmade in Bruges, the program that came from that, because here it's not a story that I want to tell, but actually the way we have chosen to uh, engage in this local context, but to try to have like a structural co-production or cooperation with local policymakers, and how the ways of working as an NGO um, can change the local policy making. So this was for us the experiment. Next, of course, of the processes it has also realized in our city. Um, so we started with that empty street, uh, and uh, there was a, a question of how can you um, Given new dynamic to that street, uh, we, s we had also made the analysis that there was a lot of urban uh, craft traditions in Bruges, but that were disappearing. People uh, didn't want to live anymore in the city. Uh, young people flee the city. And we combined it all by making a kind of program, so a safeguarding plan, for a very individual, um, networked uh, process of, of uh, craftsmanship that was disappearing. Uh, we started just very small with the European, I think this is often very important, I saw it all, uh, already also be with Ananya, that's the European funding of, of experiments and of, even if it's not focused on intangible heritage, you can uh, focus it on int intangible heritage. So we had uh, the opportunity to have some funding via the European Union uh, and just started to work on this uh, creative urban zone. I think this is also, this building where we are is also such kind of creative urban zone. But 
The big difference with the other uh, initiatives was that we were not focusing on the building, but we were focusing on the, the learning processes, on transmission. Uh, but never with a small scale or a narrow focus, we um, try to have this holistic approach, uh, which is an opportunity for heritage workers that we have uh, this holistic approach where we can um, have the sustainable development idea, economy, culture, we all combine it together and we put it in one cultural program. So we had like markets for young um, craftspeople, we had like workshop for education and transmission, we had a shop where we could sell it, uh, and then after two years work, we sh shifted to the next phase, uh, and from that one street, because it was strong now that street, uh, there was happening a lot, we opened up to the wider city uh, and adapted our program because the context had changed. Uh, the local policy was not yet convinced completely, uh, but we moved on and after two years of further work, we had um, like a, a big publication and a call for people supporting this uh, safeguarding program and um, we uh, actually convinced the new policy uh, to engage for a long-term program. So this is where we are now. We have like um, a program until 2019 together with the local uh, city uh, policymakers of Bruges where they engage with this vision of ICH into uh, a, a craftsmanship uh, safeguarding program for the city. Uh, I won't go into this because my time is running but I want to shift to the other <coughs> level because of, at the same time everything is happening, my colleagues are working on this. Uh, we also were asked by the national government or the Flemish government, uh, it's not the national government but the community government, to run, just like here in Scotland, the digital uh, inventorying processes. They had uh, uh, an official inventory but at the same time they started like a, we call it a platform, a digital platform for intangible cultural heritage. They run next to each other um, and we are trying to integrate them now but what is interesting is that the, the, uh, the Flemish government has chosen not to let develop a lot of digital local inventories or something but just to have like one digital platform which is on the one hand documenting, on the other hand also a tool for networking, inspiration and so on. And the focus of this uh, intangible heritage platform um, <coughs> is not on the elements, but is on the, the safeguarding process, on uh, the ways of documenting, on the ways of uh, organizing education, on the ways of um, uh, research and so on. So the, the various aspects of, of intangible heritage safeguarding is various dimensions. And uh, it's also like a network um, of people where you can just find people that are uh, active in the same field or experts that can help you and so on. So we started with that. Um, and uh, actually I want also, because it's again, again a question of which role do you play, we first had a rather passive uh, attitude. We just watched and see what will come. Uh, and after five years of work, we made an evaluation that actually we thought it's too much the usual suspects. Uh, it's the uh, communities or groups or uh, associations that already had this identification with heritage, uh, which is in Flanders a rather difficult notion. People do not very quickly uh, or not broadly or diversely associate with the notion of heritage. So you have like a niche or a part of society there. Uh, and now we have made a shift, we are um, preparing a very big campaign where we will go proactively, it's a shift for us we, which had, has been a, a bit difficult, we will go proactively with a, a promotion campaign on intangible heritage into the field because we believe that if the idea behind the convention is that cultural diversity is important, then it should not only be in an international level that we have like Flemish uh, um, intangible heritage to contribute to like an international um, palette of, interna of, of intangible heritage, but we should also have this diversity within our territory. Uh, and so we will be working very hard on that in the next two years. Uh, again, a question of which role do you try to, to play within your own context? Um, it's also been mentioned by Janet Blake, we are 
one of those NGOs that has been attributed a policy role, actually, an intermediate role. Um, the, this role of cultural brokerage is uh, important, but it's also because the, the policy, of course, has chosen to give this um, model a chance. Uh, and uh, we got um, the lead how to organize it. And there is a network of uh, heritage organizations in Flanders, on the one hand, organized on a geographical level. Um, I think this is possible because Flanders is not large. Um, every region or city has its own heritage workers that are not focusing on one type of heritage, but on the, the broad scope. So you have this geographical scope on the one hand, a network of cities and regions uh, having their own professional workers on heritage, and on the other hand you have like national institutions on heritage that are mostly focused on thematic uh, aspects, museums with a certain theme, uh, or then just like us, um, NGOs working on a certain theme. We are uh, an expert center on, on heritage participation, which is more like methodic, but most of them are uh, for example, on performing arts heritage or craft heritage and so on. Um, so we get together on the table and we sat there and said, how will we organize this as a field? And we um, brought archives, museums, the local heritage cells together, and we just said, we have this new convention here, we have this policy in Florence, we can just see what happens or we can get together and try to organize it ourselves. And that, that is what we have been doing in the last three years. We are really, uh, as a field, engaging with this convention and step by step looking how we can move on uh, to get it uh, to very close to the people, actually. So this is giving an idea of this uh, coordinating network, uh, which is coordinating the broader network uh, and taking a network and a mediating role. And then, um, I just add this to the story because, again, it's a question of which role do you take. Uh, there's a, the meeting of all those NGOs with all those different um, contexts internationally. Uh, I remember the first time, I, I'm finishing, the first time I, I was at uh, uh, one of the UNESCO meetings uh, and I saw all those NGOs uh, in the back uh, as observers and there were not really uh, meetings or, or um, um, interactions happening and then you also have to know that if there is a voice for communities or for um, some questions that are very at the basis of, of, uh, of this work on intangible heritage, there's only a little space into these official meetings to have it expressed. So um, it's important to reflect on that. And uh, f five years ago, this was uh, a context where we said we should get together and there has to be someone to start up the process. And as I had the luxury, uh, and I'm very conscious about that, to come from a region where this all is just happening and supported by a uh, uh, national government, I thought, okay, I know the methods now, let's try to engage and try to do this in the international way. And since then, there is also this ICHNGO forum um, that is still very developing, but where also this exchange of experience and trying to see what can we learn from each other, how should we communicate together to the state parties, to experts, and so where we try to have this dialogue go going on. I think dialogue, again, is a very important conclusion of this morning. Thank you. Thank you, Urain. Right, we've got time for about five minutes. If the other two speakers could join us on stage. We are what stands between you and your lunch. So make your questions focused. Question at the back there. My name's John Cairns from the Theatre Royal Dumfries and Voluntary Arts Scotland. And it's a question for Myra about the word globalisation, which seems to imply equal weight and impact for all the cultures of the world, but actually is the impact of particularly dominant cultures, say that of the US through film and advertising, and it doesn't really reflect what we should be aiming for and point out the danger of the dominance of individual cultures. Um, yes, actually, you're making a very good point. Um, the one thing I would say is that what's often called globalization is really about social media, um, and that a lot of minority, in inverted commas, cultures um, 
are beginning to use social media in a way that perhaps wasn't expected, and that now we're beginning to witness maybe the decline of some of the bigger, bigger groups, like um, English is not necessarily the most dominant language in the glo global media anymore. Um, and that we're beginning to see, that we're now beginning to see that the tools of globalization are something actually that we can all tap into, um, and it doesn't take um, a whole lot of expertise to make use of that. So I think, yes, um, the McDonaldization, somebody called it in a sense, but even McDonald's, if you go to different countries, you'll find the burgers aren't actually the same. They're tailored to local customs. So I think somebody in Scotland called it localization, and I think that's really what we're beginning to see now. Um, so the threat of globalization perhaps isn't as big as people think. Personal view. Okay, Anne? Um, Anne Packard. The two words or two phrases that have had, I think, the most resonance almost in this last session for me are from Gal Gale, which is the issue of worth ethic, sense of responsibility, self-respect. And it may come later, but I hope this conference might send a very powerful message to our politicians who are fairly absent from today. It ticks all the boxes, surely. Culture, social, environmental, economic, health, education. So it's not a question of the cost of the United, Con United Kingdom government of doing it. The salient question, surely, is the cost of not, not doing, doing it. it. Any comments? <laughs> yeah, I see it all interlinked. We kind of look at things sometimes in separately and out of the context of everything else. But for us, um, we're tangible heritage, intangible heritage, our work, uh, various other things are inextricably linked, almost like a Celtic not work pattern. You know, and um, if one bit goes, the pattern's ruined if we focus too much on one bit. So yeah, I, I, I would agree. That, um, for me as well, the, the rites of passage thing is important, I think. Um, just um, getting people to go through various phases of life and developing in a really positive way instead of a negative way. So I'll, I'll tie that in together, but yeah, thanks for raising it. <laughs>